Made a long time in sun Shine upon you All love surround you And the pure light Within you Guide your way on Guide your way on May the long time sun Shine upon you to settle here and now. A deep breath. Love is the strongest force in the world, says Gandhi. The strongest force in the world. Living a nonviolent life is not easy. It requires courage. Courage drawn from our inner being. 
Nonviolence is an active activity. When Jesus said that we should love our neighbor, he was teaching us nonviolence. When he said that the enemy should be won over through the power of love, he was preaching nonviolence. Thomas Merton writes that nonviolence implies a kind of bravery far different than violence. It is ours to respond from a place of love. It is ours to Embrace our enemy. It takes real and lasting courage. To create peaceful change, we must begin by remembering who we are in God. Gandhi believed that the core of our being is in union with God. And from this awareness, nonviolence must flow naturally and consistently. Nonviolence. Nonviolence is not a garment to be put on and taken off at will, it is a seat in the heart. It must be inseparable from who we are. It must become a part of what we do, how we breathe. If one does not practice nonviolence in one's personal relations, their hopes will be vastly different. Their outcome will be vastly different from their hopes. Their lives will look different. Regardless of the name that you call the divine, Gandhi believed that experiencing God's loving presence is central to what we are doing, what we are about. Gandhi says that we can have a thousand names to denote God. But if we don't feel the presence of God within, we will see misery and disappointment. Practicing loving presence must become our entire way of life. Love your enemies. Love your enemies.
the heart experiences the love. And the love overcomes all that seems difficult. Overcoming from the heart, in the heart. We say thank you, gracious one. Thank you for this opportunity to find that place where there is only God, there is only love, and we are totally aware. We've awakened in a flash. It is so, and so we let it be. Amen. wind blew hard and the rain poured down and took its toll on this everyday town comfort and security with dreams washed away it seems so like the end of days Seemed just like the end of day. And then they came. They came from nearby towns. They came from far away. They came in different colors with a God of different names. They came together in love came to heal the pain but mostly they came together and found they were the same all together now all together Together now, all together now, all together now. Walk through life, eyes open wide. Remember that there are no sides. Fear and ignorance, they have no room Whenever we're living in tune Oh, together now All together now All together now Together now, all together now, all together now. They came from nearby towns. Together, they came from far away. All together, they came in different colors with a god of different names. They came together in love. They came to heal the pain But mostly they came together And found they were the same
together now All together now All together now All together now All together now together now. Yeah. How many of you really enjoy conflict? How many of you just do everything you can to find conflict in your life? Or how many of you are conflict avoidant and do everything you can to keep from having conflict in your life? Yes? Maybe? Some? So, years ago, I was traveling in Japan, and I was with another American, and we looked pretty funny because we were pretty much taller than most of the Japanese, and we were wearing really bright colors. And it was during spring break for the young people. And when they travel, it's really interesting. You could never get Americans to do this, I don't think. But they traveled in groups, Everybody wore the same little color slicker and little hat, and the person leading them had an umbrella the same color. And they would march in lines of two just and, and follow the leader. It was amazing. We were just, didn't, we just thought Americans wouldn't know how to do this ever. But what was more interesting to us is as well behaved and as um, disciplined as they were, they all wanted to come over and talk to the Americans. Those two tall American women over there, they want to go talk to them, they want to find out what's going on. And they did. They came in, they were allowed to come and talk to us. And the first thing they would say is, can you write something for us so we can take it back to our English class? So, of course, we said, what do you want us to write about? And they said, without fail, all the different groups, we'd like you to write about peace. We'd like you to write about peace because we know what it looks like when there's not peace. We've had parents and grandparents who have been affected by the bomb that was dropped. And we want peace all the time. It was very touching. It made us stop and think, which I'm sure is their, was their whole idea. So we're going to talk about the four winds of conflict and how that happens and how those winds get to moving and causing conflict. Gary Simmons talks about the winds of conflict as being that place where we forget who we are. You know, separation. We forget who we are. We forget our oneness with God. We forget that what we do to others, we do to ourselves. So that separation, that forgetting of our divinity may cause us to do things that really isn't of our true nature. Gary talks about shifting our attention when we get into that place where we begin to look at the negative, to shift our attention to the infinite field of possibilities, to shift into what can be instead of what is in that moment. So we've got this place of separation. We need to be aware of it. We need to wake up to it. We have misperception. Anybody ever have a sense that someone didn't understand you? I, I just think that Alan Greenspan said it best. He says, I know you think you understand what you thought that I said, but I'm not sure you realize that what you said is not what I meant. I used to say that was how my dad and I talked to each other. 
<laughs> we both said things, and the other one thought they knew what they were saying, but neither one knew what they meant, really. So separation, misperception. That's that second one. And that misperception is that place where we're not communicating in a spirit of oneness. We're not communicating knowing the truth. So we can get into misperception rather easily, I think. And um, so there's, there's John 17, 23 that says, I am in them and you in me that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. I think that's pretty important for us to get. Jesus is saying, I'm here and you're here and we're all one. Really giving out that piece of we are all in oneness. So can we remember that in one of those moments when we feel agitated? There was a woman who said that um, she went into a, new, uh, in a bookstore and she had learned a lot and been in recovery from her past a very critical religion, and she thought she was over it. But she walked in the bookstore and she saw New Age. And so she thought, well, I'll go look at the New Age books. And she started walking over there and she was like, oh no, God will smite me. There will be a bolt of lightning and God will smite me. So she walked away. And then she walked back. And she walked away. And she walked back. And she finally found on the end cap a book that was by Shirley MacLaine. And she reached over and she picked it up and she looked at the back of it real quick. She put it back and walked away. Finally, she went back and grabbed it. She ran to check out. She was still afraid. She had that old tape playing in her mind of what could happen if you read these books. I had a woman in, in Beaumont. She must have come probably three years. She would come during the week. And she would check out the bookstore, and she would ask me if it was okay that she read these books. She was from a very fundamentalist church. And this went back and forth, and I kept going, what? Don't you want, if you want to come, come. If you don't want to come, don't come. It's fine. She was called to be there and to learn and to expand, and yet the fear, that old fear, was so great that she resisted. So how great is your fear? Is it part of your misperception? Is there some place in there that you don't understand yourself enough to truly go out and meet others where you are? Do you know yourself really, really well? So after misperception, we talk about competition. Now, in America, we have a lot of competition, right? And everybody wants more and bigger and best, and come on, give me some more. And that place where we want more than the other is that place that we forget our oneness. My son lives in Beaumont, and he said after the flooding, people reached out to help each other tremendously that people were giving away water and food and da-da-da. Now that things are back in order, they have both running water and electricity, there's this sense of not enough, and people are reacting, and people are becoming ugly and mean and wanting more and wanting to take and take because they've gone through that period of not having enough and opening their hearts and now they're contracting, and they want more. And that's what we do when we are in fear, right? Our bodies literally start to contract, and we don't let out the love. In heart math, they talk about the brain and the energy of the brain and how far out it goes. They say it's about five to six feet. And then they talk about the energy of the heart, and they've measured it way out, but they've never found the end of it because love appears to just keep spreading out. The energy of love keeps moving. Now, where do you want to be? In your head or your heart? 
Do you, I mean, our, our heads are important. We need them to do our math, and we need them to calculate different things. It's not that math is, I mean, that our head is not a good thing, but it's how we use it. Are we making decisions from our head that thinks there might, there's not enough? Or we want to live from our heart, where we feel that peace, that peace that passes understanding. See, the danger of competition in relationships is that somebody will eventually lose. There will be a winner, and they will be a, there will be a loser. And I had a minister that said to me quite often about relationships and that sort of thing, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? Now, that led me to close my mouth a little bit and quit whining and complaining. Oh, do I want to be right or happy? I was real clear I wanted both, but I, I did have to go, around, go away and think about it some. So are you willing to be happy, to live in your heart, to come from a place of peace? There's the, the magic of compassion from Ellen Devonport's blog. It's a man who's writing his story, and he says, I walked into a magic shop, and the owner wasn't there, but his mother was. And I would describe his mother as open-hearted, radiant, and a soul that had incredible joy. And she embraced him with that joy as he walked in, not physically, but emotionally. Have you ever walked in a room where there's been an argument going on, and you've just kind of gone, whoa, and... You didn't, no one had to tell you that there was something going on. You just felt it. You wanted to back up. So he walked in, and he felt just the opposite. He felt love radiating out and embracing him. So he stayed, and he talked and talked. And he said she wasn't judgmental. She just talked. And she said, but I notice about you that you're very sad and unhappy. And if you would like to have joy in your life, I invite you to come back, because I'm going to be here for about the next three or four weeks, and I will talk to you and teach you how it is that you can be free to have joy in your heart. It's pretty impressive, isn't it, that we can learn to have joy in our hearts, because we can have this knowing of these elements that send us down this path of discord. The other piece, and, and he talks about four pieces, is defensiveness. Oh my, I've never been defensive. What do you mean that's not right? Oh my gosh, you mean I did? No, no, that was the way I was told to do it. Everybody in here understand defensiveness and have been touched on it and even been defensive when you knew they were right, what they were talking about? Oh my. <laughs> One time I... This is about lack of defensiveness. One time when I worked at, at an airline and, and we had one of these creep, creeping delays, you know, those delays that go from 30 minutes to 40 minutes to 50 minutes to an hour to three hours. And so I, there's this long line. It's a DC-10 and I'm working it by myself and there's this long line. And I've made announcement after announcement after announcement that it's going to be delayed five more minutes, 10 more minutes. And so now this woman comes up to me and she goes, you said it was going to be 30 minutes and it's been an hour. And I said, you're right. I was wrong. And she went, oh. And she turned to the person traveling with her and she said, I've never had anybody admit they were wrong before. <laughs> so she just quietly had me recheck her in and, and everything went on. We don't know how we are so many times and, and that resistance that we do and that defensiveness that we want to be right, we don't want to look wrong. Oh my goodness, there's a Zen line that says that we sit together in the mountain, and I sit until only the mountain remains. There's a certain way in which this awareness, this consciousness, merges into oneness. And so I know that if I ask y'all to turn and look at your neighbor, and look in their eyes, and do that for 10, 15, 20 minutes, that you would start to sense oneness. I know, first of all, you would be uncomfortable and there'd be giggling, and that's usually what we do when we start those kind of exercises. But we would start to see the truth. 
and feel the truth and experience the truth and feel the heart opening even more, even more. Each of us are innately in, in love. We have that place in our hearts where we love. And we can transcend anger, and we can transcend this lack of peace in our lives if we choose. Thich Nhat Hanh writes that in transforming anger into compassion, we begin to see ourselves and the other person, and we see that there's only one thing, not two, and we begin to see that ah, we collect our anger and they collect their anger, and it escalates, or we can stand in love, and then they start to stand in love, and everybody sees love and experiences love. And there's a transformation that happens. It's called compassion. Compassion is the most needed when it's the most difficult to give. Compassion is most needed when it's most difficult to give. I'm going to just let that fall out there again. Compassion is most needed when it's most difficult. We have the opportunity to look within ourselves and learn that compassion for ourselves and others. We have the opportunity to be in the oneness and in the flow. <clears throat> when relationships change, our securities feel threatened. Another one. When relationships change, our security feels threatened. And your sense of security <clears throat> will re resist the change. Your soul and the soul of those who journey with you have conspired to help you gain freedom. Help you gain freedom. That is, those people who come to push their buttons are the people that stand to teach you that place within you that needs to be healed. So to move into this place of authentic expression of God, we need to know ourselves and to be willing, to be willing to be and face that big, honking place that's full of fear. <clears throat> so again, in, in Japan, there was a man, well, there was a young man who went to study martial arts. So he was studying martial arts there, and every day he got on the bus and he rode to the master's house, and every day he rode back, back and forth. And he had learned this martial art so well. He was so good. But you know, it was that type that you don't use it unless you absolutely must use it to defend yourself. So one day he's on the bus, and this big guy comes on the bus, and he's drunk, and he's knocking and hitting and cursing. And everybody on the bus is like, whoa, and they're all trying to get out of his way. And he continues to stumble around and yell, and the young man goes, all right, this is it. I finally have the opportunity to use my martial arts in defense. Finally, at last. <clears throat> so he stands up, and he's going to go take this guy down. And the old man sitting next to him reached over, put his hand on his arm. He said, wait a minute. Just wait a minute. So the old man gently got up and put his arm around the man who appeared to be so out of control. He said, sit here. Talk with me. What's going on in your life? And the man said, my wife died a couple of months ago, and I just lost my job. I just lost my job. I don't know what I'm going to do. He was filled with fear. And the young man learned an important lesson that he did not need to be violent. He did not use, need to use his defensiveness. He needed to love, to reach out, and touch that place where that young man was hurting. <clears throat> so again, when we come to these places of separation, misconception, competition, defensiveness, we have the opportunity to turn to love. 
we have an opportunity to let go of that place where we want to be in anger. <clears throat> in relationship, we have an experience to know and feel and express our wholeness. Relationship provides us with that. And yet, do we use the information that we have to be more full, to be more whole, to not be more whole because we are whole. We just are whole. That doesn't change. But to awaken to that wholeness. <clears throat> so community is an attribute of wholeness. And it means that we are connected in our life and with God. It means that we have a shared intention. And can we see this? Can we see the shared intention that we have here in this community so that we want to come together and be willing to understand, have compassion and love? I do. I see this as a place that we have the opportunity to love beyond any knowing, to reconcile any differences, to be in truth and love that truth that we live here. Namaste and God bless you.